Alright, so we're gonna go. I think we should kill this one. We're gonna do this one. I'm gonna sit in the back and try to back. Check one, check the other ones. I have to leave right after. Ladies and gentlemen, have a seat. We're getting started. Good to be here. Plenty of seats in the front, somehow. Plenty of seats in the front. Don't stand up. Come on. Come on up. I am your host, Johnny Goldstein, of uh, the story class of 2004. Good to be here, and uh, welcome. Awesome to be here. I just want to uh, do a little bit of business here. First of all, behold, floorboards from ITP, lovingly, laser etched, walked on by you for four decades. And hello out there to the people in streaming world. North America, South America, Europe, Asia, Africa, Antarctica, Australasia, Polynesia. This is for you. $110 goes to the, is it the Redburn Scholarship Fund? Yes. Will look great on your, on your desk. Your wall. Uh, there will be a student throughout tonight's festivities over there, and you can walk up and take one if you've already purchased one, or if you want to buy one and generously donate to the scholarship fund, they're there for you. So, uh, and if you're not here tonight out there in streaming land, but you want one tomorrow, uh, you can pick it up tomorrow. Or we can mail it. Or we can mail it. And Antarctica takes three weeks. Okay, so get them, get them while they're hot. Okay, uh, a little more business. Um, I really want to thank, uh, what year are you? 2018, Dominic uh, has done a lot of work put this together. And Midori was like, hey, can you MC? And by the way, can you put together all the slide decks and corral all the cats and all that? And I'm like, I can MC. <laughs> and luckily, Dominic stepped up to do all that other really, really important stuff. A lot more. So uh, thank you. So we're going to get started in just a couple minutes uh, with the presentations. First, I want to go, I think very own Dan O'Sullivan. Come on. <laughs> Uh, tonight, um, two things. One is to fill your brains full of all these great ideas in that short period of time of Kaja Kucha. Um, the other uh, purpose is to get sentimental. That's, that's so, to look around. There's so many memories here. Um, you know, I met my, my dear wife, the mother of my children here, and said, I, I want to marry her. Um, a more dear memory was um, chain smoking cigarettes till 5 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> um, to do something. Uh, so, uh, that was a really a memory. 
So yeah, um, we're going to uh, later on. This is called the deconsecration event. So we are going to uh, do a lot of the ringing of bells to kind of wake from all the memories and spirits and energies here, and, and kind of bring them on their way to uh, to Brooklyn tomorrow. So you know, just rub yourself with all the memories <laughs> and pollinate them up over, over in, in Brooklyn uh, if you can, if you can, uh, to, tomorrow, tomorrow night or any time. Um, really. Uh, so, you know, uh, one reason to, to do that is, you know, we, we want to bring our heritage with us. Another reason is we need to empty this space um, for other people. So this beautiful space that has served us so well, that has created so many memories for us, is uh, being recycled currently. Um, the uh, a terrific program called the Collaborative Arts Program, which is on a very similar interdisciplinary mission to us um, is, is coming in here. And so um, what I'd like to do is I'd ask um, Dean Allison Green, my boss, the Dean of the Tisch School of the Arts, please welcome. <laughs> we have, it's not Greg's bell, but it is a bell for them to bring in their <laughs> Talk amongst yourselves.
All right, we are on. Okay, so here, here we go. So this is cultivating friendships on emerging platforms in an age of disconnection. Uh, actually, these these platforms are are a little dated, but the topic is timeless. It's friendship, and it turns out. Any, how many people here have? Uh, Four or more friends, people you call friends. Good. Well, that's a lot, <laughs> and that's more than than a lot of adults in this country. Uh, there's kind of a a crisis of of disconnection in this country, and a lot of people say they don't even have one close friend who they could you know who they could reach out to if they if they needed to talk to someone. And um, I didn't quite fall to that. Depth, but this sort of explores my uh, experience with this. So, you know, in friendship, we've got a bunch of things. You need there's ways to to form friend uh, friendships. One is proximity. We get that at ITP. Repeated unplanned interactions. We got that at ITP. In a setting that encourages confiding. Common overlaps are useful. Background interests demographics, occupation. It makes it easier to talk with someone who breaks some of those initial barriers. And uh, so these are all helpful. Now, the quality and quantity of friendships, at least according to some research I looked at, has been going down in the U.S. among adults. Uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if among kids, too, uh, it could be, you know, our mobile devices, it could be geographic mobility, but I had some things happen to me a few years ago. I was, I moved, lived in a lot of different places. Uh, I had a young child who's now a bit older, and I was self-employed, and I was living in Pittsburgh. This is after ITV, where I really didn't know anybody. I didn't grow up, and I started getting kind of bummed out. I didn't have... You know, I had old friends, but I didn't have friends where I lived that, you know, I could see face to face. So, you know, for me. And I think I even remember sending some help messages out to uh, ITP Blisser. Uh, and then um, I moved, we moved back to New York, thank God. And walking around the neighborhood with my little kid, I noticed, wow, there's a lot of people here with little kids. And there's a lot of dads here. With little kids, and we didn't, you know, belong to any religious organization in the neighborhood. My kid didn't go to school in the neighborhood, so we didn't have those parental connections with other people. But I thought, what could bring some of these dads together? And I thought about it, and I thought the, the timeless intervention: fermented malt beverages. So I decided to start this, this uh, Jackson Heights Dad's Beer Meetup. And I posted it on the Yahoo listserv that was very active in our neighborhood with all the families there. And then, you know, I just thought, okay, well, we'll see what happens. Pick a place, pick a time, we'll see if anyone shows up. Soon media started reporting on <laughs> Jackson Heights Dad's <laughs> playing get together at local bar. It was August. It's a good time to launch something. It's a very slow news month. A TV station wanted to do something. I mean, I'm like, no, that's too much. You get people from New Jersey. It's going to be crazy. And I showed up at the bar, and I, I didn't know if anyone would come. And soon there were like 30 people there. So obviously there was an unmet need. And uh, had a great time. And uh, I knew maybe one or two people from the neighborhood, but most of them I, I didn't know. So, uh, and then started seeing some of these people around the neighborhood. Hey, so we had the proximity, it was neighborhood based. Uh, and then we, you know, we had something in common, we were dads, 
and we broke an ice and like met each other. And uh, maybe things are going to look up here. So, uh, and indeed, I started hanging out with people playing with power tools while our kids played in their co-op basements. And uh, it was it was cool. And some of these guys have actually turned into real friends. And, and some of them are acquaintances, which is good, too. So uh, I was... I was pretty happy with it. So here's my uh, thing. You know, first, uh, if, you, if you have a problem in your friendship network, admit you have a problem. Think locally and think about overlaps. I know. <laughs> Dot com. <laughs> um, I don't know what this is supposed to represent. I made the slideshow a long time ago. Uh, so here we are, on a pillar, looking down on Earth, happier than those people down there, who only have a few friends. So, uh, so basically the way it works is get the venue, it's like the diviest Irish bar in Little Bangladesh in Queens, announce it on the various social media platforms that correspond to that, what, what people use in the neighborhood, you know, do it, have meet up and then just repeat. And uh, I'm happy to say that you too can do this. Uh, think, think, allo, whatever that stood for, and uh, and fist bump your way into better friendships. And now I need to see who our next presenter is. Okay, so yeah, I'm Johnny Goldstein, I'm visualizegood.co, there's my social media stuff. And um, next, I have the pleasure of introducing to you Anthony Bui, 2019, the last thing. Test, test. Awesome. We're gonna get real sentimental, so it's gonna be great. Um, I invited a few extra people who worked on the project um, to speak, so I don't have to speak the whole time. Um, over here we have Nia, Jim, MH, and G1 is right here. Um, no, I'm just gonna. <laughs> How do I know? Yes. Hello, my name is Anthony Gould. Um, I graduated a long, long time ago in the year 2019. And, uh, I have a long time ago. I have a master's in ITV now, which is great. But even more, I like to think that I have a PhD in ITP camp. And so, I actually want to talk about ITP camp because I've been at camp for four years. And here's a taste of uh, good times at camp. So if you don't know, ITP camp happens every year, it happens in June. Um, I started four years ago. Uh, and that was my first introduction to the floor. So that was a very special moment for me when I first learned about this magical place. 
Um, it's much like IGP, it takes 100 people, it mixes them all together, and it condenses everything into one long sleepless month. Uh, and so uh, this year uh, at Camp we did this special project and I convinced a lot of people to do a lot of stupid things with me. Uh, the old timers and the newcomers meet. And here I'm the old timer and I'm sharing the joy of the floor with a lot of these newcomers. And so I've convinced them to stay late and dance and make a music video featuring the ITP lasers. Uh, after that project, we started thinking a lot about the floor and what it means to us and how to close up the, the last camp on the floor. And we were thinking about how to say goodbye to the floor properly. Uh, the floor, we've been thinking, is, is this very public place. And it's, had, oh shit. <laughs> it's had a lot of people that it's loved between these walls. And we were thinking about how to create moments uh, that are normally so uh, a three-room experience so that you can have intimate moments with the floor. Uh, we thought a lot about third peoples and where stories go. Um, and in New York, a lot of that comes to the bartender, so we, we, we built a little speakeasy to collect stories. Here's the dance floor where we created a tiny dance floor where you and the floor can share a last dance together. <laughs> and we told you you can take as much time as you need. After the dance floor, you proceed to our little speakeasy bar. Like any good New York date, you go to a speakeasy. Um, so on your last date with the floor, you go to this VDV and we give you uh, some mystery cocktails and uh, in exchange for a mystery cocktail you have to tell us a story about the floor. And finally, as you exit, we, we try to end the date nicely and give you a nice little chance to have a good night kiss with the floor. <laughs> Thanks Brandon. And so, and so we didn't know what to expect. We were collecting stories, and that was a big goal of this. Um, and what was really cool is we, like any bar, you get phone numbers that just show up everywhere. So here we got Dano's phone number. I don't know what it is, but I hope it's his personal helpline. Um, everyone watching, call at 3 a.m. You have my permission. And we started just collecting a lot of uh, cards that represented these stories that we heard. Um. <laughs> Um, so we were, um, a couple of the stuff that we collected were that the floor is a welcoming space. I mean, um, whenever I see Daniel's with a mirror, I'm immediately just like, okay, I don't know, it's so short. Um, um, a lot of awe, awe, and also welcome that you're on the floor. And we heard a lot about love for the floor in that when you're here, you don't want to leave. And then when you leave, you always find a way to come back. Um, and so we found that in this, 90, people coming here since 96, and... So, full of magic. The floor is full of magic. The late night music, the tapping sound on the keyboard, the smell of the laser, the chemicals. Uh, love the floor. There's freaking floor, square words, and the joy of laughter and friends. Yes, Carl. Um, so, the floor is also where you make connections, where you make friends. I mean, I think everyone, the people, friends are here. And it's also where you meet your project partners and colleagues and um, other romantic relationship people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had a bunch of great stories about people and the more illicit side of ITP. Uh, yeah, so um, lots of things. I remember my first, um, I don't know, the thing. And, orientation when we're all like this. Someone was like, I'm here to find a husband. And all the guys were like, <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, it holds true for camp. Yeah. I, uh, hi, I ended my thesis presentation by saying ITP is an English word. Right? And also called ITP Wonderland. And in Wonderland, the Red Queen, no pun intended, tells Alice yeah, that in here, one must do all the running they can do just to stay in the same place. I know, I'm sorry. And <laughs> you know, so yeah, that's her. So uh, in the end, we want to finish this book with more memories. Um, and so over here, we've, we've put out some materials if you want to add a, a picture of our story. Um, and what we're doing is going to collect them and finish the book tonight. Um, and I know it's weird. It's like, Anthony, it's so analog. There's no screens. There's no machine learning. Um, but there's a, I've been thinking about this a lot, and here, this, this is a picture of the library on the new floor, and this is my favorite space on the new floor. Um, 
And there's a there's a deep reason because in the madness to move from Brook, Manhattan to Brooklyn, a lot of things got lost. But the library seemed to have been remarkably resistant to modernization. Uh, and so I found a spot for this book to live for 40, the next 40 years between ActionScript 3.0, Assembly, and Photoshop CS4 and Flash. I think we can have a book of memories that reflect the last 40 years for the next 40 years. Uh, keep shout out, keep shout out to all the people who helped with the project. Um, yeah. Thanks, that's what we're going to do. All right, well, I know this is a, a fun floor. A lot of fun has been had here. But it's a little bit dangerous. There's some there's some cables here. If you're coming up to present, don't trip over the cables. Don't get any splinters. Don't make any dangerous liaisons. That was a public service announcement. And. Um, but that was good. That really made me want to go to ITKP camp. I have a not. I've yet to do that. I'm already married. But uh, <laughs> okay. So um, okay, and now we're going to go to our next presentation. Uh, that was a great, great kickoff there. And now we have. A very interesting topic. The gender inclusivity challenge. My journey bringing more girls into the maker movement. Put your hands together for Natasha Zerny, 2014. Oh, PSA, public service announcement. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, well, fourteen seats available here. So if you're standing in the back, come on up. Don't be shy. So I'm, I'm going to talk about a few memories I have here uh, while they're getting their thing ready. Uh, does anyone remember the sound booth in there, in that room over there, whatever that room is called? It's a very oppressive, uh, tiny, claustrophobic booth. And Red, Red Bernstein, Red Goldie Bernstein, as that, that's Red's name, can be revealed now. Goldie Bernstein. <laughs> Revealed her name to me in that sound booth when I was interviewing her. She was so claustrophobic, she kind of lost it. I asked her what her real name was, and she told me. Okay, so uh, with that, Natasha Zerny. journey trying to bring girls into the maker movement. So when I was a little girl, I loved making crafts. I loved making things. I had like this three-dimensional mind, and I loved putting things together. Um, I loved making my own stuffed animals. I loved putting glitter on things. Um, I loved pink and purple and wearing dresses. Uh, and my parents owned a computer store, but I was never really brought into uh, that world. And then when I went to ITP, I discovered Maker Fair. I actually did part of the Nerdy Derby and the um, own wrestling projects. And when I got to Maker Fair, this is kind of what I thought I saw. Really cool tech, really cool toys and things that you could play with, but it just wasn't something that eight-year-old Natasha would have been brought to. So I decided to do my own Maker Fair project. And this was my design criteria that eight-year-old me would want to make. Okay, so the first thing was it needed to be crafty and expressive. So each bit, each project needed to be unique to its maker. 
Uh, it had to be simple so that you could do it with zero level experience, no experience necessary. And that it could be inexpensive, so almost everyone out there could do this project. It had to be fun and quick, a five minute project. It needed to be shareable so that you would be proud to share your new creation with your friends. And it, I wanted it to combine craft and tech because that's what I was given as my maker materials when I was eight. And I wanted to combine old and new skills. So this was what I came up with. A series of paper flowers that would have little holes that were ready for an LED and that could be mixed and matched and created to be unique to each maker. So I was really, really excited about this. I thought it was a great idea, and I made a whole bunch of these ready to go to Maker Faire. But then I realized, oh my gosh, am I excluding the boys? Like, am I doing exactly the thing that I don't want to experience myself to like the boys out there at Maker Faire? So I actually kind of went back and I thought, okay, flowers, that could be like a corsage, and I decided to make a companion project that were blinky bow ties, so an LED bow tie paper craft project. So that's where, what I thought the boys might like to do. And now I had the girly version, the boyish version, I thought I was all set, so I took it to Maker Faire here in New York. And it was actually really successful. We did 400 projects in the first day with kids and adults and people who were really excited to build something. A lot of parents brought their daughters up to me and were like, finally something that she can do. I was like, this is amazing. We won to make her hair ribbons. Like it was really a wonderful experience. So then I also decided that this needs to happen more. So I did two Kickstarter campaigns, one for the flowers, one for the bow ties. And I saw a lot of people emailing me and saying, like, this is a really great, quick project. Uh, it was becoming something bigger. And I took all of these projects, I made a whole bunch of them with the money from the Kickstarters, and I booked maker events all across the country, the big maker fairs, other branded maker events. And I was able to make projects with over 5,000 kids. So I have now 5,000 interactions in my brain of making this project with girls and boys and young and old. And I even had the opportunity to pitch this on a national TV show. So what I noticed was that I was a little bit incorrect about the whole, the girls will go for the flowers and the boys will go for the bow ties. Yeah, that happened a lot, but a lot of times, you would have the opposite be true. So I was like, okay, change of plan. I'm going to make a pack to myself that I'm going to offer every single kid either a bow tie or a flower. So like, would you like a bow tie or a flower? Would you like a bow tie or a flower? Would you like a bow tie or a flower? Because I didn't want to assume that they wanted one or the other. I'm trying to remember what my next slide is. Bow tie, bow tie, bow tie, bow tie, flower, bow tie, flower, bow tie, flower. And what I what I saw in every single city, no matter where I was, there was always some kid that had their project ripped out of their hands for making their own choice. And I saw tears, and that happened in every city. So that really was heartbreaking to me because I felt like I was creating this project, and now this kid's upset. Um, but through doing this, I also learned about my own bias coming forward. Because when I was saying, would you like a bow tie or flower, would you like a bow tie or flower, would you like a bow or a flower, would you like a bow tie or a flower, I noticed that if I was asking a girl with a lot of pink on, or who had like really cool like glittery thing in her hair, I would subconsciously and accidentally remove the tie word, even though I made the absolute intention to say both words. I would be, um, uh, go ahead, no. I would, I would accidentally do that. So I realized that it was, oh no, I'm ahead. Um, yeah, I don't know where I am. What? 
Uh, no, I, I, I missed the thing two seconds ago. Anyway, um, so I wanted to talk about what was working. What was working was that we um, made a project with choices and that we made sure that we gave every child the choice. And I, and I had a, the chance to reflect on those micro interactions that I was having, those micro switches of words. And if all of us could just take a moment or when you're working with kids to be self-aware and just see if there are any of these micro changes that you're making, maybe once, maybe in the future, we can all create this world where every child can make without boundaries. So. Uh, quick housekeeping for any of the presenters. Uh, if you share your slides with me as view only, can you please uh, give me full access? Uh, it affects the timing, apparently. <laughs> All right. Well, I love the last couple presentations. Uh, it, this I to be as many places, but one thing it is through uh, every little fiber is it's a it's a place where creative things happen, and creativity is uh, is in the air here, and we're creating memories here tonight, and. We are going to create more memories tomorrow, and memory feeds creativity. Um, how many people are are uh, planning on coming tomorrow night that are here? And it, great. That's great. And it, it's totally cool if you're not coming, too, because I know it's not, it's not cheap. But if you do want to come, we still do have tickets, and the reason they're charging money for it is for the scholarship fund. So there's lots of free events too, luckily, but be sure to check that out if you want to. Uh, we still have some tickets. Okay, so now, one of my favorite things. If, you, um, as in, if you've ever been to Jackson Heights, this is a neighborhood in Queens, and you walk up 74th Street, you get off the subway, and it's, it's Little India, basically. And there's a lot of interesting signs and stores, and there's a place, I think it's a travel agency. It's called Time Travel Inc. You have to look up. It's on the second floor, and I definitely should sell T-shirts because um, that's it, they don't have a big sign. It advertises itself. The product sells itself. But we have another time travel themed presentation here. Recently possible time travel. How I digitally archive a historical site to delight future generations. Please put your hands together for Shreya Chowdhury of the class of 2019. Archive an historical site to delight future generations. So, I have a pretty simple story. I heavily identify with the fact that I'm Indian and I'm a dearest. But that's almost anyone born to Indian parents. You basically grow up knowing that you are predestined to do and become what your parents want you to do or become. 
And at some point, it will all make sense. But that's not what we're talking about. It's basically for you to understand me as a person. So, life's right. But tell me the last time, or try and think about the last time, you truly felt privileged or to be in a certain place, at a particular location. It could be a physical structure or even somewhere out in the open, like a field or garden. And it's basically the last time you felt a rush of emotions just standing there, at a place where history had taken place. And now, if you're having trouble trying to figure out this vision out as quickly as I'm asking you to do, you can come and step in your mind. I grew up in a state in India. Wait, what? No, no, that's the second one. <laughs> okay, so come and come and step into mine. Um, I grew up in a state in India where every kilometer or half a mile you'd find yourself in a spot where a battle had been fought or a saint had lived. Or there was a king who would build a temple for a god who is yet to be incarnated. And went. No, no worry. So, uh, being incarnated. And I can keep going on about this incredibly rich heritage that I come from or these stories I've grown up with. But the realist in me would rather tell you something a little less That. There's a chance that in, say, 50 years from now or 70 years from now, these stories may or may not be known. And worse, these structures may or may not still exist. And we work again? No, it's not this. You know, say, it's not a bit. There we go. Sorry. So, we can't really control what will happen in our lifetime or in the ones after us. Disasters, whether natural or man-made, are inevitable, and more often than not, unstoppable. But perhaps what we can do is preserve our present. It's possibly the only way we can show how much we truly value it. And then you say, oh, I have a few pictures and videos, and I'm sure my kids, kids, kids will be fine with that. But that is when I ask you, are you even IDP if you don't take an unimaginable idea and try and make it real? What if you took time travel and instead of thinking of it as something Hollywood blew out of proportion, look at it as a thread that could just tie time and space. So I felt all these emotions and to stop myself from falling into this pit of despair about lost culture and heritage, I went back home and started looking at the art that belonged to my state, Rajasthan. It was 2D, somehow only showed fair skin but used its miniature dimensions to tell entire stories that would leave you staring at it for hours. Then I found two collaborators and began revisiting all the places I saw as a child. Listening to stories I had somehow forgotten for two decades and bringing movement to these 2D miniature images that were scattered everywhere, basically breathing life into something that stood still for centuries. Then, once that was complete, it came down to making it accessible to more than our happy family of three. And that's when I started playing with augmented reality and simple image recognition. We've been talking pretty fast. It's good, it's good. <laughs> but then. I am the well, Singh. Nice. Nope. <laughs> um, so, what we did was. We started breathing life into these miniature images and using augmented uh, reality so that people could access it just through their cell phones. And then we identified this massive fort and started getting in touch with them. And trust me, I'm just gonna like skip of the That's it. I also So we identified this massive fort, we started getting in touch with them and trust me. It was not a cakewalk because I was convincing an organization that had existed for centuries that audio guides can uh, are pretty sucky and can't really do any justice to <laughs> the stories that exist. Um, there are people who might only come to this palace like once in their lifetimes. Like, shouldn't they be leaving knowing the history in as much rich detail as possible? This is like a good thing But, um, so once. We were in and we were a part of that fort and we started working with it. 
I had basically felt that rush I spoke about in my first few slides. And all right, so okay, so I started, I started being that rush that I spoke about in my first few slides, and uh, we created the yeah, app. We created, we recreated a story. We recreate a story that would exist inside the palace so that whenever somebody would come there, they could actually